Hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Miller. I'm the Product Marketing Manager for uh, AVG Business by Avast. Today I'm joined by the team from Imperscale. This is part three of three. Uh, this session is being recorded and the previous sessions were recorded as well. We'll follow up with an email for you so that you can uh, watch the presentation again. Um, there's a couple of things that we need to know. Um, this session itself is incredibly timely. Since the last presentation that Ken gave, there's been a number of large organizations have been hit by ransomware. So in San Francisco, the, uh, for a whole weekend, the municipal transport system was free because the computers that controlled their ticketing and their uh, bill collection w weren't available. They'd been struck by ransomware. Locally in Ottawa, where I'm based, the local university was hit. 60 machines were hit, and it took, uh, took a bit of time to get that back. So very timely topic here. Now, Ken Shaw, I've mentioned his name, and his name is on the slide here. He has built a career and a company protecting businesses, and he protects those businesses by protecting their data. So Ken is, is a subject matter expert. He's an engaging presenter. And as I said, this is part three of three. So uh, we do encourage you to watch, if you haven't seen them, to watch part one and part two. Just to quickly summarize, part one was all about, uh, if I can sum it up in the, in the lyrics that Ken chose, it was uh, a song by Cher. If we could turn back time, there was a defensive way to get your data back. Uh, part two was a Joni Mitchell tribute in that uh, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And I got to say, I struggled with part three, if there was any way we could come up with a song lyric to describe it. So at first I looked at Chris de Berg, you know, don't pay the, the ferryman. I then thought about Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, about talking about being held for ransom. And then I discovered there's a country western singer called Ned Stuckey that recorded a song saying, don't pay the ransom. So that would be my musical shout out. And Ken, you're probably giggling inside. Um, I think I've introduced you well enough. Please take it away. All righty. Thank you, sir, and good to be back. Um, good morning or good afternoon to everybody on the line, depending on where you're joining us. Probably good afternoon. Most of the folks on this session are, uh, are, are somewhere in Europe. Um, so let's dive in. And uh, like Andrew said, today we're going to focus on the endpoint side of things and what you can do to uh, protect yourself at the endpoint level against ransomware. The agenda looks a little bit like this. So we'll... Um, talk through just uh, briefly the evolution of ransomware and how it's changed, and it's changing quickly. So this is something that, you know, um, every three months, the, the, the sort of tapestry of, of, of threat that we're dealing with is changing. Um, we'll then look at endpoint solution in particular and the different types of technologies you can deploy there to, to, to help protect and prevent ransomware and then recover from it after it's occurred. Then we'll talk about the InfraScale solution specifically. So that's the part where I'll, I'll sort of really tell you about our company and what we do. And then we'll do the Q&A, uh, which is in an Ask Me Anything format. The Q&A is a bit of fun because we give away a prize. So on the screen here, you can see the three different prizes we're giving away, um, an Xbox One, an Apple TV, and a Parrot drone. And so the prize goes to the person who asks the most on-topic questions. How does it work? Well, you find the Q&A section within the On24 app, and you can actually find it right now. It's, for me, it's at the bottom of my screen. I think it's probably where it is for you too. And you can just type in a question. Um, and uh, you can certainly start doing that right now, right? So um, on the line also, we've got our marketing director, Carla Federigo. She'll be typing some answers to questions along the way. And uh, we'll do the, at the end of the session, we'll talk through as many questions as we can, and then we'll follow up in writing for those we don't quite get to. So if you would like to win one of these doodads, and as the proud owner of all three, I can tell you they're all a bit of fun, um, find that tool and, and start asking us questions. All right, so with that preamble, let's um, dive in. I'm actually going to start it with an audience poll. So we'd like to gather some information from you guys. And hopefully I've pushed that to the screen, and maybe, Andrew, you can confirm for me that that has, in fact, gone out to the audience. Um, but folks, what we're asking here is pretty simple. You know, um, have you or one of your customers been affected by ransomware already? Yes. No, neither I nor any of my customers have been affected. Or option three, uh, I'm just not worried about ransomware. I'll have a sip of my coffee here while we do that. For me, it's quite early in the morning, and I'm, uh, I don't like early in the morning. <laughs> All righty. 
So let's pop the results and see what we've got here. Wow, look at that. A whopping 90% of you have already experienced ransomware. 10% of you have not. And thankfully, none of you say that you're not worried about ransomware. Very good. We normally get like 5% of people say they're not worried. I'm always curious what they're doing in the webinar. <laughs> this webinar is decidedly about um, how to protect and prevent you know, against ransomware. So let's dive into the meat of that and look at, well, first, we're going to look at the evolution of ransomware, right? The concept here of ransomware is, is not new. And so, you know, to sort of just go back to first principles and look at a definition of ransomware, ransomware is nefarious software installed, you know, um, by some sort of malcontent, which has the objective of kidnapping something of value. It could be a computer, it could be a file, it could be an entire network, and then demanding payment, right? And so ransomware is is named for the real-life physical crimes of, you know, kidnapping and ransom. Um, it's the digital equivalent of it. I'm going to going to take away from you your business database and I'm only going to give it back to you if you pay me, right? And so early variants of this emerged you know, not long after the birth of the personal computer. So uh, as early as 1986, uh, there were tools that allowed you to lock away certain files that would prevent machines from booting um, and then you would, you know, you would levy a, a ransom demand in sort of the old school way. Imagine, you know, <laughs> with the, the newspaper cutouts with each different letter. But uh, the point is it was decidedly low tech, right? Um, and back then, ransomware, like any sort of uh, extortion, was tracked down by law enforcement officers pretty rigorously and done by following the money, right? Um, it's, you know, if you're a bad guy, it's one thing to extort someone. It's another thing to get paid in a way that can't be traced. And so that in general kept this in check, right? Um, then a few things happened, all in the noughties, all you know, starting 2006, 7, 8, 9. Some, uh, the technology landscape changed such that the dynamic which kept uh, ransomware in check um, started to change. And I attribute it to three major transitions. The first was fundamental to all this, the development of high-speed asynchronous encryption protocols. So the way ransomware works is it you know, encrypts the data on your computer, either all of it or the important stuff. And it's got to do that at a sufficiently high level of encryption and entropy that you can't just brute force decrypt it yourself, right? Um, and so, you know, with RSA and other public key encryption algorithms that were developed, excuse me, in the late 90s and early 2000s, that enabling technology was therefore in place for the bad guys to use. Um, the irony, of course, is we developed those technologies to help defeat hackers. <laughs> um, and here they are using them against us. Then the second big thing was the proliferation of powerful CPUs uh, on the desktop, right? The exercise of encrypting an entire hard disk drive is non-trivial from a computational perspective. And so, you know, in the in the 90s, if with any modern processor, if, if it was working away encrypting your disk in the background, you, you would notice, right? And your whole computer would sort of be sluggish and um, you'd really notice a performance hit. Well, these days we have excess compute power inside our computers, right? Um, particularly with the new hyper-threading and multi-core CPUs that have become standard in the last 10 years, We've just got this excess compute power that can be encrypting your hard disk and you don't even notice it, right? But then the, so, okay, so if you put those two things together, hackers have now got basically effectively unbreakable encryption tools that they can use and they've got so much, you know, horsepower grunt on our PCs that they can easily encrypt their whole disk without us noticing. Cool. They still can't get paid. And so enter into that equation these digital currencies, specifically Bitcoin, the most famous, but also Ether and others. Why are these so vital? Well, these were the things that allowed ransomware to grow into the multi-billion dollar industry it is today. Those are the tools that allow these guys to get paid. Typically, when ransomware hits a machine or a network, they demand payment in Bitcoin or Ether. And because of that, it makes it incredibly difficult for law enforcement to follow the money and actually catch the bad guy, right? And so um, 
again, it's sort of one of the, you know one of these unintended consequences of a cool new technology. But um, the rise of those anonymous currencies has allowed this sector of you know the, the criminal world to absolutely flourish. So when I say flourish, what are we talking about? Well, we're literally talking about a billion-dollar cash industry in 2016. Who knows what it's going to be next year? So, um, I mean, on the screen is some statistics. The uh, the statistic that oh, I actually don't see it here that, that worries me the most is the 256 million cash payouts from Q1 of this year. We know it's only accelerating, so it's going to be at least a billion dollars in cash payouts this year, um, which is staggering. Right. If you think about this, you've got you got a bunch of sort of hackers, pretty low tech hackers, frankly, working all around the world, using toolkits, running these attacks relatively indiscriminately. Um, Andrew mentioned the the Muni hack of the train system in San Fran. The investigation so shows so far that it was a kid using a toolkit and it wasn't targeted. Right. He didn't mean to do, take down the Muni. He was basically port scanning. Um, so that's firstly a comment on the poor state of security that they had in place. But secondly, it's a comment on on just how um, widespread this bad behavior is. Uh, so we've now got this shadow economy. We've got tens of thousands of hackers, and I put that in air quotes because these a lot of these people are very low skilled. Um, let's call them bad actors. We've got tens of thousands of bad actors who are making tens of thousands of dollars by extorting businesses in the US and UK and Europe. Uh, a lot of these bad actors are coming from Eastern Europe, but also more and more and more from Asia. Um, and the trend is absolutely accelerating, right? So it's a, it's a big problem already, and it's a problem that's not going away. And unlike most hacking, there's a clear economic incentive. Uh, when I grew up, a lot of my friends were hackers, and um, I understand that world very well, but most hackers were, at least in my generation, were motivated by the challenge of defeating a system, and it was done for bragging rights, right? Um, and you know, maybe uh, so. Some bad hackers, right? Sort of poor actors, they might do some damage. They might, you know, tag a website, for example. It was the equivalent of digital def uh, graffiti. But it was never done for money, and that's changing, right? This is clearly a financial endeavor uh, with an enormous amount of money changing hands, and that is then causing an entire cottage industry to spring up around ransomware, not just of the bad actors who are running these networks and running the attacks, but actual software companies who are working in the shadows and building tools that they sell to these guys. Uh, I don't know if we've got a screenshot of it in this in this deck, but... There are places on the internet you can go where you can buy entire toolkits end to end that'll get you set up as a ransomware um, operation today, right? Uh, and you've literally got software teams out there working on these and building these and selling these, which is pretty scary. But anytime there's a billion dollars at play, that's going to happen. Uh, so some of the variants you might have heard of, um, you know, here are some of the more modern variants. Um, BitLocker is uh, certainly one that you hear a lot of. Uh, Locky is another one that you hear a lot of. Um, I think the most important thing is that the names are going to change, the methods are going to change. This is a very fast-moving field, right? Um, and so, again, it, for the, many of you have actually been a victim of this and you've got experience and you know what it looks like. For those of you who haven't, you know, here's a couple of typical kind of warning screens or, or demand notices that you get served. Um, you know, bottom line, your data's been encrypted, you've got a countdown clock, and you need to, to pay up in Bitcoin. Some of the nastier variants will actually increase the, the bounty as the clock ticks down, um, which is, you know, adding insult to injury. All right, so with that um, fairly depressing introduction to the concept, let's turn now to what we, the good guys, do about this, right? And if you've attended the two other webinars in this series, you'll know that we focus very heavily on technology called DRAS or DRAS in those. Um, DRAS is Disaster Recovery as a Service, and it's really a new frontier in data protection and system uptime protection. I encourage you greatly to go back and listen to those or, or learn more about DRAS. Today, though, we're going to talk about endpoints, um, which are a vital part of the equation and often are 
right? And so um, when I talk about endpoints, uh, I usually contextualize them in, in what we call the data value pyramid. This is a bit nerdy, but indulge me for a second. If you take any given business, right, from a 50-person shop up to a 50,000-person you know, shop, the following applies. Um, but I'm going to use a 500-person hospital, okay? So maybe it's 200 people at the hospital itself, got a, you know, a bunch of labs and offices and maybe a few doctor's offices where physicians see employees, right? So it's a distributed healthcare organization. They have a bunch of endpoints, right? Probably every employee has a laptop. I certainly know when I go and see my doctor now, she's entering all my information on a tablet. Uh, and those are our endpoints, right? The laptops, uh, desktops, um, although those are becoming fewer and far between, the tablets that are out there on the edge of the network. Then you've got your remote office and branch office core infrastructure. So think about this as the, uh, you know, the, the server that's inside the, the, the laboratory where they're doing the blood work, for example, right? There's going to be some critical infrastructure in that remote office or branch office. The next sort of most valuable up the stack becomes the infrastructure installed at the core data center. So probably in the basement of that hospital, there's a server room and there's 30 servers racked and stacked, right? And that's sort of our core data center infrastructure. And somewhere in, within that mix, you've got the mission application infrastructure. So in the case of hospitals, they're often running a, an ERP system called Epic. Right, that epic system, if it goes down, the entire hospital just grinds to a halt, right? So that's what we call mission critical. And usually, um, so, okay, so why is it the data value pyramid? Because the stuff at the top is the most super critical, right? And as you sort of go down the layers of the pyramid, the data on the individual node gets less and less important. But it doesn't mean it should be ignored. And the modern reality is, is something like this that your mission critical infrastructure and your core data center infrastructure is usually protected. It's a uh, very lax CIO that <laughs> would allow these layers of infrastructure to not be being backed up or have disaster recovery technologies in place. Um, but when we look at remote office and branch office and endpoints, that's often where we find that these things are exposed, right? particularly with endpoints, those laptop fleets. Um, and so what's interesting in the context of ransomware is that this is the point of ingress. If you analyzed 100 ransomware attacks in the field, 99 out of those 100 entered the network through the endpoint, right? This is the point of attack. And more modern variants of ransomware can then work its way through your network and work its way through this stack and actually start to target your mission critical applications, which is really scary. Um, and those software shops I mentioned earlier, you know, these aren't dummies making their tools more and more and more sophisticated. Um, but in general, it all starts with the endpoint. And yet the endpoint is usually the area that is most overlooked when it comes to both AV and security and when it comes to protection and disaster recovery. And I mention security um, because I really want to emphasize this. And this, this slide, I've done this out of order, but to me this slide is critical, right, that the way you handle ransomware, the way we fight back, to use the metaphor of the slide, is really a one-two punch. Okay? You need both security technology and you need BDR technology. The security technology there is there to try and prevent a ransomware infection from actually occurring, right? It's your perimeter defense. It's your, it's your security guard, right? And ABG's got some fantastic products that you can use to actually try and prevent infections from occurring. But we all know that security doesn't, doesn't always work, right? Because users might disable it. They might not do updates. Uh, there's a whole variety of reasons why threats can still sneak through your security. A uh, study last year found that 47% of ransomware attacks happened even in the context of security software being deployed, right? So then the second part of this equation is backup and DR, the ability to turn back time, as, you know, I, I quoted Cher in the first webinar, as Andrew reminded us. Um, but that's really crucial, right? If you can turn back time to the actual minute or whatever, the day before you're infected with ransomware, then you can carry on operations without having it really impact you, right? 
Uh, and so this one-two punch is really the way we fight back as an industry against against ransomware. So what I'm then going to spend the next few minutes talking to you about is what to look for in an endpoint backup solution, right? Not, not for your critical infrastructure or for your data center. We covered that in part one and part two of this webinar series. Today we're going to talk about what you look for on the endpoint side of things. And here's a laundry list of things, but we, and we're going to go you know, into more detail of these. But um, most of you all on the line are uh, IT resellers or VARs or MSPs, right? IT service providers. So obviously you want to find something that is channel friendly, right? Uh, the second one is rare. It's not. It's harder to find, but it's very important. Um, it's an, what's called anomaly detection. I'm going to talk a lot about this, but basically your, your data management tools and your backup tools should be able to detect when funky file change patterns are occurring. And ransomware is the most common funky file change pattern. Right, um, and then some other some other things to look for: unlimited versioning. You want to be able to roll back to kind of any point in time. You don't want that limited. Um, it needs to work when a device is connected to the network and not on the network. You want options between file and folder backup as well as bare metal backup. You want a, a very broad range of device supports. You want to be able to protect, for example, tablets as well as laptops. Uh, granular recovery points. You want to really be able to go in and pick. You know when we're rolling back to multi-factor authentication is important too. So let's um, let's sort of dig into these. Uh, I'm now going to tell you about the Infrascale solution. Let me just back up though and tell you a tiny bit about Infrascale. Uh, we're a company born in the cloud with a, with a simple mission. Uh, our mission is to eradicate downtime and data loss. And ransomware is interesting because it it actually threatens both. It threatens to for you to lose your your data and it causes downtime while you're trying to recover from it. So ransomware, ironically, um, <laughs> as, a, as an enemy, is doing the, the very two things that we were born as a company to fight, right? Uh, which is one of the reasons why we're so active on the ransomware conversation. Our mission is to eradicate downtime and data loss, and that's exactly what ransomware threatens. So we've got a solution that brings you back from any disaster, including ransomware, in 15 minutes or less, guaranteed. Right, so we'll give you your money back if we can't meet that. Um, and so if we go into to what that actually means, there's two parts to the Infrascale story. One is the Infrascale disaster recovery solution, which we covered heavily in, in parts one and two. And then the other is the Infrascale endpoint solution, cloud backup solution, which we're gonna drill into today. So when we talk about cloud backup, there's uh, kind of three broad buckets I think you need to use to evaluate a vendor. And, and by the way, a lot of the slides I'm about to present aren't specific to Infrascale. These are concepts you should use to evaluate your own endpoint protection. Uh, many of you aren't going to have endpoint protection already in place, uh, so that you can kind of use this as a buying guide, right? First big bucket is ease of use. If you can't easily deploy this to all your, you know, your clients' laptops and, and machines, and if they can't easily operate it, or better yet, if it can't be operated silently, then this isn't going to work, right? Um, one of the, the, the big problems with doing anything at the edge is you've got to make it really, really simple and really, really consistent so that everybody's protected, right? You don't want to chink in the armor. Uh, so things like having an MSI builder so you can drop out, you know, an installer of a group policy in Active Directory, invisible backup agents, uh, no VPN or other funky networking requirements. Um, fast uploads and recoveries using dedupe and, and full file dedupe so it's not having a noticeable impact on the performance of the laptop. Uh, no user rebooting. All of this is important because it's, we really want to make this invisible to your employee, right? In an ideal world, you go into the management console, you drop, you build an MSI, you drop it into your network and boom, everyone's up and running. And that's how it works in Infrascale, by the way. Uh, the second big bucket to look at is security and compliance, right? There are a million vendors out there, most of whom are not behaving appropriately when it comes to security and compliance. There's a few sort of key things to look for. Um, you know, one is multi-factor authentication. So, you know, are they providing multiple ways to actually authenticate that you are who you say you are? Two is uh, the encryption levels they're using. AES 256-bit is the gold standard, right? Um, Make sure they're using TLS, not SSL. 
um, make sure that they're providing both in encryption at transport and encryption at rest. A great question to ask your vendor is, if I lose my, my encryption key, can you access my data? And if they say, oh, yeah, our support people can unlock it for you, da 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 hang up the phone, right? The answer to that question should always be, no, sir. If you lose your encryption key, we can't get your data back. Uh, that's really important. Um, the other thing is compliance, right? So making certain that your vendor of choice is HIPAA compliant, is SOC 1, SOC 2 compliant, um, you know, SSAE 16 audited. Uh, here in the United States, Sarbox compliant becomes very important, right? FINRA compliance, CGIS compliance. So there's a laundry list of compliance certifications you can ask about, and if they check off those boxes, then you can start to feel good that they've, you know, that they're, they're running a robust operation on the back end. Um, oh, and product fit. So the last one then is making sure it's got everything you need, right? You'll find actually a surprisingly wide array of features supported between different solutions. You really need to go and find a business grade solution. Um, there are a lot of pretenders in this space. Stay away from the sink and share vendors. Stay away from the consumer oriented folks. Like in my personal opinion, something like a Carbonite or a Mosey just doesn't cut it, you know, for any sort of business grade solution. So you want to be looking at something like Infrascale, something like Truva. Um, you know, the, these are solutions designed for very large scale deployments to handle, you know, hundreds of businesses uh, when it comes to endpoint protection. Um, okay, so let's look at some other features. Scale. So, you know, ask, ask your vendor of choice how many endpoints they're protecting, right? That'll give you a sense of if they can scale. Infrascale is protecting more than a million devices around the world. Um, Look into hardware requirements. Ideally, your endpoint protection software and endpoint backup is just going to be software only, right? Um, you know, if you look at something like a data where you have to go and deploy a box into every single location, that gets difficult when you have tons and tons of locations, right? So with our software solution, we can do everything data does, but do it without the hardware. What does that mean? Well, it's cheaper for you, the partner. It's cheaper for your customers. It's way easier to operate. Um, you don't need to install hardware. You don't need to replace hardware. Uh, make, just makes the entire process far more, uh, you know, elegant and simple. Um, what's the net result of that? It means you get greater protection and more consistency, and that means fewer threats, less likelihood of uh, being able to handle ransomware. The next bucket is actual ransomware protection, and so I've got a video on this in a few slides where I'll talk about it at great length. But we've uh, we have gone and built technology into our system that specifically fights ransomware. So using machine learning, which falls under the, you know, the artificial intelligence bucket, which is a buzzword used way too much, but using machine learning, we've built algorithms into our system that monitor data change patterns. And because we see all your data change patterns, think about this, right? We're, we're snapshotting your computer every hour to, to back you up. Because of that, we see all these patterns. And we're training our cloud, and it's getting smarter and smarter every day to detect patterns that look funky or specifically look like a ransomware attack. And because of that, we can then notify you, and we can tell you when to roll back to. This is really cool technology. And as far as I know, we're the only vendor on Earth doing this, right, um, where we're actually using AI to detect ransomware and then help you roll back to the appropriate time. Then the last bucket is centralized management, right? It's, I mean, an endpoint tool is great, but definitionally it's going to be out there on a lot of nodes. If you've got 100 customers and they've got, you know, 10 endpoints each, then that's a 1,000 nodes. So you really need a terrific centrally managed, you know, dashboard to be able to administer all of that. Um, you know, things like automated user provisioning, granular permissions, monitoring reporting, geo-tracking, device management, this all becomes super important. So... Um, I guess the next few slides, I'm actually going to talk a bit about us. Um, so it's a little bit out of order, but that's okay. So on the screen here, you've got a screenshot of our central management dashboard, and it does everything I just said, everything from being able to build your own custom installer for central deployment to device management to uh, activity alerts, reporting and monitoring and account usage. Uh, it plugs beautifully into whatever other infrastructure you're running. If you're running Autotask, if you're running ConnectWise, it connects into that. Um, 
my favorite part of the dashboard is the ability to actually locate devices anywhere in the world and then remote wipe them. So we're a data protection vendor, but we believe that sometimes to protect data, you need to destroy data, right? So if someone steals a laptop from my company, not only can I see it on a Mac, but I can issue a, you know, a remote wipe command, um, which is pretty cool. So our central management portal is, um, is, is a really terrific management tool with a lot of advanced functionality built into it. Uh, the next thing is that whilst it's great to be able to aggregate everything up you know, to the central level, you also need to be able to drill down, right? So with us, uh, as an administrator, you can log in and do everything that a user could do right at their desktop, meaning you never need to go to their desktop or you never need to VPN in or remote in from somewhere else, right? Um, so you could go right into an individual user, see what's going on, modify their backup schedules, modify their policies, uh, et cetera. Very powerful. Uh, the next thing is advanced analytics, right? So one of the things that we know that backup admins and storage admins in general want to know is just what's going on with my network, how much storage is being used, how many files are being changed, are my backups happening consistently? Uh, in this screenshot, you can sort of see this little uh, board down the bottom with all these dots on it. This is pretty cool. That's a calendar view of different, and so it's got five computers, right, in each column's calendar and it's showing you if there are any errors, right? So green means everything's cool, gray means um, we didn't run, and red means there was a problem. So you can get a super quick visual snapshot of the, of the health of your network, right, in a glance, which I love. Uh, just really makes looking, you know, looking at large scale data across your network trivially easy. Uh, the next one is remote wipe and geotrack. So I already kind of alluded to this, but, um, Sometimes to, to save your data, you've got to, you've got to destroy your data. And so that's where our, our data loss prevention features kick in. Um, when you're protecting endpoints with InfraScale, you can find them at any point in time, right? It's kind of like find my iPhone, but for your Windows and Mac laptops. Um, and so this, uh, you know, this technology becomes very powerful in the context of a device having been lost by an employee or stolen by an employee. And then um, count level details are pretty much covered. Uh, anomaly detection. So let's go here. So this is in, this is a big part of our ransomware story, right? So the most common form of anomaly that we're going to detect in your system is actually ransomware. That, this wasn't true two years ago, um, but the threat you know, the threat matrix has changed. Ransomware is now the number one disaster affecting businesses in the Western world. Um, which is crazy, right? So all of a sudden, the whole disaster recovery industry has gone from being worried about power outages and floods and fires and uh, you know micro failures and hardboard failures to ransomware. It's the number one disaster that we're that we're facing. Um, and so the, what we've built into our system is a whole bunch of uh, AI that where our cloud gets smarter every day at detecting ransomware across your network, right? And we'll then tell you and notify, hey. We've seen some activity over here on this laptop that we think is dodgy. You need to get in there, take that laptop off the network, and take remedial action. And of course, if in fact there is a ransomware infection, we then tell you the point in time to roll back to, and you can easily roll that laptop back. So we super easy. And we've actually got a video of this. So um, I think I'm going to try and figure out how to play this video. Hopefully that's working. This is Senior Product Manager Derek Wood welcoming you to another InfraScale how-to video. Okay, here we go. So in this video, uh, so this is our dashboard. Okay, we saw a screenshot of this before. Um, you can see it's co-branded here, so you can brand this yourself. Uh, this one's co-branded with ABG Business, but you can put your own logo in there. That's true of a lot of our other technology as well. And you can see here you've got a lot of high-level alerts, a lot of high-level information that lets you get a quick snapshot of all of the businesses you protect and all the devices with modified files in the business. background of a user's uh, What I particularly like is the software. I can manage, you know, this on a device level, at a company files, level, or even have other partners paid. in under me. So if I'm a distributor and I don't have settings. a bunch of my own resellers, the, tab the portal supports all of that. But I'm going to go in here and look at the, Once some the of the advanced page, features we have around monitoring, the specifically the anomaly detection. Um, Here, so once you turn it on, you just try to tell the computer how sensitive we'll you want the algorithm to be, warning. right? So it it's doing statistical deviation analysis across, of modified you know, across your data set and then it's comparing it to 
game change pack my device the million devices on our cloud. No data is being shared. This is talking about the data change that pack, average you know, and the more data, right? Um, if you're subscribing to so, warning and error events, you get an email, oh, but it oh, also oh, appears in the here that the um, page where we can see more information. The video audio may be if playing, and I may event, be talking then we recommend over it unnecessarily. You can click to see more details. And you can also go to Manage and download the logs directly to investigate at a file level. Typical users are going to back up. Um, if, if there's any five, member of the audience, can you tell us if the video audio was playing? We were so under the impression that the video's three to four audio was that not three going to be playing. is going to be cause for investigation. For more information, visit infrasale.com or check out our YouTube channel for more. Okay. Well, so look, folks, I think there was a bit of a snafu. Um, some people could hear two audio tracks. Um, apologies for that. We, we were told that that wouldn't be the case and that I was going to need to talk over it. Uh, I hope that the point came through, which is, um, which is this. You can turn on, turn on our anomaly detection system. We're using machine learning to get smarter every day. We've got a million devices that we can pull data from, and we're training that system all the time to get better and better and better at detecting anomalous file change behavior. What does all this mean for you? It means that we become your early warning system. We're going to tell you if ransomware is happening on any of your nodes, and then you can intervene. And we're going to give you the ability to roll back, right? So not only are we sort of, we're sort of like your home alarm system. We can tell you that there's an intruder, but then we're also like your home security robot. We can we can get rid of that intruder for you and, and roll you back to a safe state, right? So when I talk about the one-two punch earlier, um, you definitely want security software in place to stop somebody from getting into your house. But if they do get into your house, you, A, you want to know about it, and that's what we do, and B, you want to get rid of them, and that's what we do. So this is why having, say, an AVG and an InfraScale becomes a really terrific combination to protect yourself against ransomware. And, you know, uh, our approach to this is getting a lot of attention, right? So recently, Gart the Gartner Group, who are, so Gartner, if you don't know, is the world's preeminent technology uh, analyst firm. Um, and they've started to take notice of what we're doing. And so last year, they named us as Cool Vendor, uh, which makes us, you know, kind of the coolest company in the nerdiest category on earth, business continuity and disaster recovery. Um, and uh, this year, they named us Visionary in DR, right? And so the way these magic quadrants work is the top right, uh, basically, the, from the bottom to top is how big your company is. From left to right is, you know, how complete is your vision. So here, Infrascale debuted at the top of the Visionary quadrant, which is where we want to be, right? Because we, we, uh, we want to disrupt everyone up here in the leaders quadrant. And I'll just talk for a second about our DRAS offering. You know, with our DRAS offering, we can bring back your entire network, right, hundreds of computers, in 15 minutes or less guaranteed. So the best IBM will guarantee for you is two hours, and they charge uh, five times as much as we do to give two hours, and we guarantee you 15 minutes, right? So we're a far better service at a much lower price point. Really encourage you to check that out. Excuse me. All right, so we're in the home stretch. I'm going to give you a few, um, bit of a corporate overview of Infrascale, and then we'll go to that Q&A and the giveaway. So I said it before, our mission is to eradicate downtime and data loss, which uniquely puts ransomware right in the crosshairs because ransomware threatens both of these things. It threatens data loss if you don't pay, and it immediately causes downtime, you know, between when you, the ransom demand hits and whenever you resolve the situation, right? So... Ransomware is enemy number one as far as we're concerned. In terms of who we are as a company, we've been around for a while. We're founded in 2011. We do disaster recovery, cloud backup, endpoint protection, and ransomware protection. And why do we do it? Well, we really believe that every company has the right to protect their data and keep operations up and running uh, and do it simply, flexibly, and affordably. We don't think this should just be the purview of the, the global 2000 and the big banks. We think every business should have the ability to fail the systems over quickly and get back up and running. The computing industry is weird. It mainly focuses just on productivity enhancements. And it's done a good job of that, right? Uh, all my music is digital. All my movies now are digital. 
You know, when I do my tax returns, it's digital. When my kid's sister writes college essays, it's digital. So we've come a long, long way in terms of making our entire lives driven by computers and data. But we've done a lousy job as an industry of making it resilient and making it foolproof, right? Um, no one focuses on eradicating downtime and data loss. Um, you know, I, it, it, I joke, if, if this was the automobile, automobile industry, we'd all be driving around in cars that go a 1,000 miles an hour but have no brakes and no airbags, right? And that's the computing industry today. Everything's about speed and productivity. None of it's about making it resilient and safe. Um, and so that's what Infoscale is focused on. We're a small company fighting a huge problem and really making a difference. We're protecting a million devices. Uh, we've got 900 partners, 15 data centers around the world. We're protecting more than 100 petabytes of data. And so this, uh, we call this the matrix, but this kind of shows everything we do, okay? So it's a little bit of an eye chart, but let me walk you through it. The columns are the different types of devices we protect, uh, and the rows are the use cases. So today we've been talking about cloud backup and recovery, the middle row. So let's look at that. So with our cloud backup tools, you can back up and recover iPhones and Androids, and that's real. We've got full-on apps for them, um, desktops and laptops across Windows and Mac, physical servers on Windows, Unix, and Linux, and virtual servers on VMware and Hyper-V. That's the broadest support footprint you're going to find in the industry. We believe that's critical because if we're going to, you know, if our promise is to protect all your endpoints, we better be able to protect all your endpoints, right? Uh, then push-button failover is our DRAS solution. This is where you literally push a button and, and all your machines magically come back up in the cloud. Uh, and that is more focused on servers. So that, you know, focuses on Windows, Unix, and Linux physical servers, and then VMware and Hyper-V virtual servers. We also provide long-term data archiving. You'll find that we're, um, this is incredibly affordable. So if you've got customers who've got a demand for, you know, parking data somewhere at a very low price point, we also supply that. In terms of where the, the cloud is, we say that we support your cloud, our cloud, or any cloud. Um, and what that means is, you can use one of Infrascale's 15 places, you know, data centers around the world, or you can use your own private cloud. So if you've already got a hoster, or if you've already got your own data center, or your customers have private clouds, you can go ahead and use them. Or you can use third-party clouds. So our software runs with Amazon and Azure and soon Google and IBM already. So you can use us with the major clouds. And lastly, we do also sell prepackaged appliances. In terms of scale, uh, we really are a global firm. Uh, you can see here, every red dot represents a business being protected by Infrascale. We're active in over 172 countries, which is more, more countries than the United Nations. Um, more than 50,000 businesses being protected, a million devices, 900 partners. I know a lot of you this morning are joining us from Europe. Uh, as you can see, our footprint is, you know, in Europe is, is, is very strong, uh, as is AVGs, I might add. Just a little case study, um, a tale of two universities. So um, I'm not sure if you, not sure if it hit the news uh, for you guys, but there was a university in, uh, in Canada, and its name is escaping me for a hot second, but it'll come to me. Um, oh, the University of Calgary. And they had, a, they had a professor who was doing some research and had done very original research over a 15-year period, got hit by ransomware, and all of his data, all of his findings were wrapped up in this attack. And they brought in experts and they brought in, um, you know, the, the Canadian equivalent of the FBI. And at the end of the day, they had to pay the ransom, right? It was 18,000 Canadian dollars. Um, and, uh, I mean, that was the only viable way for them to respond. They couldn't break the encryption. Uh, it had hit all of their backups and their archives. See, this is one of the things people don't think about, but oftentimes companies are set up so that you back up data and you back up data, you back it up, and then you age data out of your backup system. So you purge the old stuff. So you only keep like the last 30 days. Well, guess what? If you didn't catch the ransomware infection, you can age it out, right? Um, and so a lot of backup systems actually actually delete the very data that you need when they age out older snapshots, and now they're just retaining the dirty ones. Um, and so, you know, that, that group, that research group within the university was down for weeks, and then they finally shelled out 18 grand. I want to contrast that with the University of Virginia, 
so Ellen McCree, who's pictured here, a uh, happy customer of InfraScales. And the quote is, with InfraScale, I quickly and easily recovered clean versions of our files with minimal user impact. It was easy peasy. Her total downtime from when she became aware of the ransomware infection to when she was back to a clean state was only 1.5 hours. And she reports that a large part of that was getting, you know, permission from the bureaucracy to actually do the rollback, right? Um, so we've got lots more case studies like this. We'd love you to talk to some of our customers and learn about it. But we really do provide a solution that helps you detect if you get hit by ransomware and then turn back time. We're like the undo key for your, you know, for your network. Um, you can hit Control-Z and we can roll you back to the, the moment before you're infected. Um, <clears throat> Also, just want to. Uh, this is just a little bit of a. Um, I'm just going to promote <laughs> some new resources we've created for partners. Um, so, a lot of you on the line are, are resellers and thinking about becoming a partner of AVG or partner of uh, Infrascale. We we've created just an enormous library of marketing materials and educational content, all of which can be co-branded. So, you know, one of your first jobs and responsibilities is to educate your customers. And so using all this material, you can whack your logo on it, you can get it to your customers. Um, and, and education is the first line of defense, right? So we really encourage you, there's no cost to this, really encourage you to get this material, co-brand it, and actually start training your users up, making them aware of the threat, teaching them some basic digital hygiene so they don't click on phishing emails. Um, and that's all available gratis. So if you're interested in that, uh, please do get in touch and, and just say you're on the webinar and, and you want access to some co-branded materials. And so that brings us to the end of the formal webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Um, next steps, uh, talk to us, right? Get a, get a free evaluation. Um, get a demo by a sales engineer. Um, I've only sort of glossed over some of the features today. You can, you know, you can talk to a sales engineer and he can walk you through it. Um, you can get an evaluation and play with it yourself. Uh, so to do that, you can contact Infrascale directly, or you can contact your AVG representative if you're already uh, an AVG customer. Um, and so AVG and Infrascale work very closely together. Uh, they'll get you to the right place. Um, or just contact Infrascale directly. Uh, now, one easy way to do that is to answer this next poll question. Um, and we're going to leave this poll question up when we move to the Q&A. But basically, would you like to learn more about um, our endpoint protection, our anti-ransomware, and our DRAS solution? Um, the second option here is yes, but I just want educational material. So to be clear, the first one is like, I want an eval, I want to talk to a sales engineer, I want a demo, uh, that sort of thing. Um, the second one is, I just want you to send me some reading material. And then the third one is, no, I don't want to learn anything. <laughs> and with that, uh, we're going to come to the Q&A, folks. So this is the time when you get to ask us anything. And you can post questions to the AVG crew or you can post questions to me. Um, and remember, we're giving away uh, the winner of the person who asked the most questions is going to win one of those prizes. Um, so don't be shy. Um, and with that, Andrew, I, I suppose I'll pass the ball back to you, mate. Okay, thank you very much, Ken. That was uh, phenomenal. I've got a full page of notes here, and I actually saw the deck before you presented, so thank you very much. Uh, if anybody does have questions, please use the Q&A part at the bottom of your screen to put the questions in, but let's, uh, let's get through these. Do you offer 24 by 7 support? This fellow is more of a night owl and wants to know he's going to be able to reach somebody. We do. Um, and so if you're a night owl and you're in Europe, you'll reach our American team. <laughs> And night owls in America, European team, but we do offer by seven supports. Okay, well, I'm glad you mentioned Europe because the next one is where are your data centers? Or would that be data oh, centers? Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> All over the world. Um, so we've got six in North America, um, which is both in Canada and in uh, the United States. Um, in Europe, we've got one in. Uh, in the UK, also one in the Republic of Ireland, also one in Germany. Um, and we're looking at some other continental locations at the moment. Uh, and then we've also got, you know, we've got data centers in Asia and in Africa uh, and in Latin America as well. So we're truly a global footprint. In addition to that, we can run on top of any public cloud. So in addition to the, the 15, on, you know, we have, you can look at the Azure map and take any of those locations and look at the Amazon map, take any of those locations. 
Um, and so pretty much wherever you want to, uh, this to run, we can make that happen. Fantastic. So there's a couple of compliance questions here as well. Um, this fellow has regulatory compliance issues. I don't think you can help me. Uh, can you help with compliance? I know it's a very open-ended question. Yeah, well, it's going to depend what uh, framework you're dealing with, right? So, uh, in, in general, frankly, the answer is yes, we can. Um, some of the most common things we get asked about are HIPAA, uh, which is the healthcare you know, regulations around data. Um, the in in Europe, you've now got the new Privacy Shield regulations that are that are percolating through the system. Um, here in the United States, you've also got Fender and Sarbox rules. The answer is usually we can, right? Um, our customer targets. So we work with the channel, but we find that our channel partners do very well with financial services, legal services, banks, healthcare, hospital, government, education. Uh, what do they all have in common? Well, they're generally regulated, right? So I don't know which particular um, I don't know which particular privacy or data movement regulations you're dealing with, but we have probably already been certified and we've probably already got reference you know references and, and reference customers dealing with those same issues. Okay, I've got a bit more focused one on compliance here. Uh, so with HIPAA compliance, one of the requirements is the data be secure and it be kept private, so uh, it can't be taken through a breach. What about an endpoint that was stolen? I know you mentioned it that if, uh, if an endpoint was stolen, uh, like a laptop, how do you protect the data that was on that laptop? Great question. Um, so this falls into the bucket of what's called uh, DLP, data loss prevention, right? And uh, most backup and data protection vendors ignore this. Um, but like I said earlier, we believe that to truly keep data safe, sometimes you have to destroy it, right? Um, and so we've built we've built technology into our solution that allows you to mark that laptop for self destruction. It's a little a um, little bit like Mission Impossible, but um, you know we, we are set up so that we can either purge just corporate data off a laptop, or we can nuke the whole thing and literally brick it and just do a complete erasure of the hard disk drive remotely. Okay. Uh, the next question is more of a product roadmap question. Are there any plans to include Citrix Zen virtual servers in your matrix? Uh, yes and no. We're looking at it. It's got such a tiny market share at the moment that we're sort of not actively pursuing it. Um, you know, if it gains market share, then we will. Um, so that we sort of try and align our resources behind, you know, is that have, will get us the most threat. Two other areas that we are exploring right now is Docker support um, and, of course, uh, OpenStack support. Um, so, you know, we're looking at both of these technologies closely. Um, so I, I th this is a question that was asked early in the webinar, so we, I know you answered a couple times. I didn't listen to parts one or two. What is DRAS? Oh, okay. DRAS yeah. stands for Disaster Recovery as a Service. And um, guys like me can't decide whether or not we're going to call it DRAS or DRAS. Um, it should probably be called DRAS because it's a play on SaaS, right? Software as a Service. Uh, it's DR as a Service. But a lot of folks seem to now be coalescing around calling it DRAS. Anyway, acronyms aside, um, the concept of it is that just like with with SaaS, with software as a service, Salesforce gives you an amazing software application, but you don't ever get a copy of it. You don't install it anywhere. They run it in the cloud and they rent it to you monthly. Same concept here with DRAS, right? I'm going to give you the software, the hardware, the network, and the people you need to achieve 15-minute failover, right? And I'm going to rent that to you monthly. So our DRAS offering is literally that promise, that no matter what your complexity you install InfraScale, and for $129 per terabyte per month, we guarantee to bring you back up and have, give you running computers, not data, give you running computers in 15 minutes or less. Uh, and it usually only takes a minute or two. We're very proud of it. It's breakthrough technology. It's why we're really cool, Vanda. It's why we're the visionary. We're, we're five times faster than IBM, and we're one-fifth of the price. Wow. Um, the next question, I guess, is more of an industry-type question. Um, seeing as InfraScale looks after so many devices and businesses, what sort of proportions do you see between the InfraScale cloud, 
private clouds, third-party clouds when you use the InfraScale applications? Well, what's the general mix? Or is that too the hard to put you your finger on? No, it's, I get asked this by investors a lot. Um, the InfraScale cloud is by far the most common. I'd say it's 60%. Um, then private clouds are the next most common. I'd say it's 20%. And then the remaining 10% is third-party public clouds. Um, so third-party public clouds are certainly growing. Um, and so that begs the question, why do people choose the InfraScale cloud? Well, the answer is our solution is cheaper, faster, better for DR. Okay? So I'm not asserting that I, have a, that I run a better cloud than Amazon. I don't. Amazon has an incredible offering, which is a multi-purpose tool that can be used to do many, many, many things. But I have a cloud that was purpose designed, purpose built for disaster recovery, backup, and archive. And because of that, my prices are a lot lower than theirs, and my performance is a lot you know, better. I'll give you one anecdote to, to sort of round that out. If you're running it for scale on top of Amazon, uh, we can't guarantee 15 minutes. It takes four hours to bring machines back up, right? So it's a four hour guarantee. When you're running on the Infoscale cloud, uh, it usually takes one minute, maybe maximum two minutes, and we guarantee 15 minutes. Uh, so I think that's why the Infoscale Cloud is so popular, is that it's you know, highly tuned for the job it's doing. Andrew, are you still there? Sorry, I guess as I moved, I hit the mute button on my uh, set. Sorry, if anybody has any additional questions, please type them in the Q&A pod. Uh, we have uh, just a few more minutes remaining in the webinar, so a chance to get those questions answered in real time. Um, we had that one. Um, I guess it's time to announce the, the winner of the... Um, of their choice of the three things. Um, do you see the question on your screen, Ken? Uh, I do. Uh, are you talking about the question from Andrew Gordon? Yes. So um, yeah. I'll let you Andrew, announce we'll the good follow news. Up. Yeah, Andrew, we're going to follow up with you on that. Um, and so you know, thank you for those details and, and, and apologies. So uh, you'll hear from us. Um, and then uh, the winner for today is Dean. Um, and so again, if you can provide your contact information, then we'll be in touch with you um, and get that out to you. And Andrew, um, yeah, thanks for your contact information and, and we'll follow up with you again today to, to organize that. Um, so that brings us to the end of our series, folks. I hope that over the course of these three webinars, if, uh, well, if you stuck with us, and firstly, apologize, apologies, you had to listen to me drone on. <laughs> but I also hope, hope it was useful in some way, shape, or form. And, and perhaps together we'll stop, you know, we'll help some businesses avoid ransomware, which um, is actually a noble cause to pursue, you know. So hopefully we've done a little good here. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ken. This brings us to the end of uh, part three of three of the, uh, of the 2016 series. I know we've talked about what we're going to do in 2017. So um, everybody, please stay tuned. Uh, you'll be seeing um, a follow-up to this webinar, which will give you a link to the recordings. And also watch your inbox. You'll be seeing news of our 2017 webinar series that we'll be uh, hosting as the new year kicks off. So thank you very much, and I'll bring the webinar to a close.